This is the mortgage. Cindy's college money. Mm -hmm. If I do right by Mrs. Christian, the circle she runs in, this could be the break we've been waiting for. Can't take more than a couple weeks. That's all I can tell you, honey. Sometimes you can't know what I'm doing. It's better that way. It's always that way. You come highly recommended, Mr. Wells. You're praised for your discretion. Thank you, ma'am. As you know, my husband passed away recently. Yes. My husband was the only one with the combination to the safe. These were my husband's private things. I didn't. I didn't realize. Do you want to tell me what you found, Mrs. Christian? <laughs> Private Detective Tom Wells is one of the only people who has seen it. It is eight millimeters wide. It runs at 16 frames per second. And he has been hired to discover... All I want is to know that this atrocity is false. I want the proof of it. If what's on it is real. the guys who made this film is going to be very difficult. I need information. I thought you might be able to help. You name the device, I name the price. I'm going to tell you, there's things that you're going to see that, that you can't unsee. They get in your head and they stay there. Some doors should never be opened. Tom, where are you? You dance with the devil. The devil don't change. The devil changes you. Because once you go through, be okay. Be okay. there is no going back. No! Nicholas Cage. I'm trying to understand! Whoever you were, just forget about it. I can't. There's no one left to finish this but me. Eight millimeter. by Joel Schumacher. Hello and welcome to The Complete Works, an in-depth look into the career and filmography of Nicolas Cage. My name is Mike Smith, and joining me on this journey into the depths of true cagedom is my friend, co-host, and fellow cageaholic, Mike DiCrescio. How you doing today, Mike? Good, good. I think today, uh, as always, because we're involved, it's going to be a great episode. Absolutely. Every time we are involved in something, it is just like magic. It is yeah. it is like La La Land. It is <laughs> <laughs> it, it is sparks flying everywhere. It's just beautiful to behold. Is this a musical and you didn't tell me? Yes. yes. Damn it. <laughs> All right. Uh, so when I randomly break into song later on in the episode, you'll know why. Yes, it all and, makes sense. And now. suddenly you will too, and you won't know why. <laughs> you won't know how you're doing it. But you're going to do it. Uh, it's time yeah. to party like it's 1999, Mike, because that is the year we're entering now. <laughs> as, wow, we're as, so close. As we take a look at a mystery thriller Nicolas Cage starred in from director Joel Schumacher, and that thriller is a movie called 8mm. Now, Mike, you were pretty excited about 8mm um, in the weeks leading up to this. I kept saying, like, hey, we're doing 8mm, and you were like, oh, cool, snuff film, like that kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, snuff film's not the reason I was excited <laughs> <laughs> But you, you uh, I think you were excited because of the genre of movie you were kept. Yeah, it, this is one I'd, I had heard of uh, and had heard that it's like a crazy, weird, dark thriller about like CD snuff film industry and stuff. And that just sounds really interesting uh, in like a creepy, like I just want a morbid curiosity kind of way. OK. Uh, and they, we'll see. We'll, we'll, I don't want to give <laughs> yeah. anything. Now, uh, the name Joel Schumacher has become something of an infamous name among the geeks of the world. Uh, after a couple of decent hits early on in his career, like uh, St. Elmo's Fire and The Lost Boys, uh, Schumacher now seems like he will forever be known as the guy who ruined Batman for, <laughs> for a while. Uh, he was the director of Batman Forever and then Batman and Robin. Uh, often, Batman and Robin often considered one of the worst movies ever made. Uh, yeah. I... I, yeah. I, I I mean, it's bad. Like, I, it's it's bad. <laughs> it is real bad, but it's also very enjoyable to watch. I think it's it's like a camp classic to me. Yeah. Uh, now I I can't remember exactly. Is that the Mister Freeze one? That is the Mister Freeze one. Okay, got it. Yeah, exactly. And same, same with Batman. Like both of those movies are not good, but I think they are 
at least it, I, I feel like Batman and Robin has given me so much joy over the years. Yeah, uh, on a pure, it's just silly on a purely like, like movie riffing level, and like I feel like I can't hate it entirely. Uh, but it did, it did ruin Batman for a while. It's the reason why we have dark and brooding Batman now. Uh, right. It's because uh, Batman and Robin went way too far in the other direction. <laughs> so, uh, and you could argue we're too far in the current direction uh, as as of this moment. Batman's not in a great place right now. He's 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 had yeah, some but dark he's times. got he's got some gravitas, Mike. He has some gravitas. That's whole, yeah, that's his whole character now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so 8mm was Joel Schumacher's next film after Batman and Robin, uh, and there seems to be almost a conscious effort to kind of get away from the campiness of that movie here. Uh, and that's where screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker comes in. Walker was well known as the screenwriter behind Seven, directed by David Fincher. Uh, and fun fact, uh, David Fincher was actually the first choice to direct this movie. Wow. Yeah. That would have been a whole different movie. It would have been a whole different and probably a whole lot better. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Like, literally, before I even knew that David Fincher was the first choice to direct this movie, I was watching the movie, and I was thinking to myself, man, David Fincher could knock this out of the park. Like, oh, yeah. Because I, I, I had known that Walker was involved with Seven, and so I was like, well, this this play is very much like Seven. The only difference yeah. is that, you know, David Fincher's not involved, and it's a lot weaker <laughs> as a result. Uh, 8mm was a script that took a few years to get made, and uh, in the meantime, uh, Walker did uncredited work on movies like David Fincher's The Game and Event Horizon. Uh, and now, uh, when Seven was being made, the studio wanted to make several changes to that script, saying that it was too dark, but Dave Fincher and Morgan Freeman stood behind Walker, and it went unchanged. The same thing happened with 8mm, except the opposite, because Joel Schumacher sided with the studio, <laughs> <laughs> Suppos- oh supposedly making a ton of changes to the script, and overall lightening the tone substantially. Uh, and this led to a big falling out between Joel Schumacher and Andrew Kevin Walker. And Walker has essentially disowned this movie and walked off set during its production. And he refused to even watch the film when it was released. Wow. Yeah. So a uh, lot, lot of backstage turmoil with 8mm. Uh, but it was a solid hit at the box office. On a budget of $40 million, it earned about $96 million. It did get a pretty negative reception and currently sits at a 22% of Rotten Tomatoes based on 80 reviews. Uh, and when you watch it, you can see why uh, there, there is something that's kind of like oddly compelling about it. I thought, you know, for, yeah. a, for a while, uh, but there's, yes. there's always a hint of a better movie lying just underneath the surface. That's like trying to get out, but it's, it's, it's not quite there. Uh, and I, I don't think, uh, Schumacher can help, but be at least a little theatrical or fantastical. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily serve this movie story all that well. Right. Uh, with certain characters. Uh, but 8mm stars Nicolas Cage as Tom Wells, a private investigator tasked with finding a girl in a snuff film who may or may not be dead. Uh, she, she is. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. <laughs> Well, she is. Uh, Joaquin yeah. Phoenix is in this movie playing Max California, while James Gandolfini is in this playing Eddie Poole. Uh, Peter Stormare from Fargo plays uh, Dino Velvet. Uh, you remember Peter Stormare, correct? He's, yes, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah, he's Dino Velvet. I'll play a very theatrical and weird character in this movie, yes. I, I might add. Uh, Anthony Heald plays Daniel Longdale, the lawyer, and he was also in Kiss of Death, so there's a Kiss of Death reunion there. He was also a Hannibal Lecter's nemesis in Silence of the Lambs and Red Dragon. Uh, Myra Carter plays Mrs. Christian, and Catherine Keener plays Cage's wife in the film, Amy Wells, and this was the same year that she was nominated for an Academy Award for being John Malkovich, so that's neat. Uh, and Norman Reedus is in this movie, Daryl from The Walking Dead and The Boondock yeah. Saints. Uh, he's, he's here, uh, and, and he's like six years old. Like he's, <laughs> he's, he is but a child. Maximum six. <laughs> Uh, he appears uh, for one scene in this movie as Warren Anderson. Amy Morton, currently starring on Chicago PD on NBC, plays uh, Janet Matthews, the girl's mother. And finally, Chris Bauer plays Machine. Uh, and you may remember him as the prisoner that Nicolas Cage fights in the movie Face Off, uh, which is That's pretty That's a cool. face-off reunion. It is a face-off reunion as well as a Kiss of Death reunion. Plus, uh, you mentioned that he was on The Wire in season two of that show. Yes. Yeah, he's uh, Frank Sapatka, I think. is the uh, Yeah, that's his name. He's the uh, the, like foreman of the docks or something like that yeah very cool and uh, eight millimeter was written by andrew kevin walker who has since written movies like tim burton's sleepy hollow and joe johnston's the wolfman and most recently uh, an animated movie from last year called nerdland which starred paul rudd and Patton oswalt uh i actually saw there was 
uh, this movie got made. I remember seeing a lot of support for it on Twitter. People were talking about it a lot because this was a movie that took a long time to get made. Uh, and right. went through a lot of changes. And I remember seeing trailers. It ended up playing in theaters for like one night only, like a Fathom Events kind of thing. Um, yeah, that I, sounds really familiar. Yeah, I remember seeing trailers for that uh, a few months ago. And this movie was directed by Joel Schumacher two years after Batman and Robin and just a few months before his next film called Flawless, which starred Robert De Niro and Philip Seymour Hoffman. Spoiler alert, critics didn't think that movie was flawless. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, you're so proud of that one. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, and most recently, Schumacher directed the 2011 film Trespass, which we're going to have to talk about one day because that also stars Nicolas Cage. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> In the distant future of 2025. Yeah, if the world still exists. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we ever get to those movies. If we ever get to that point. Uh, and he directed a couple episodes of the first season of House of Cards as well. That was the most recent thing he directed. Uh, and the IMDb plot synopsis for 8mm reads, A private investigator is hired to discover if a snuff film is authentic or not. <laughs> that's just the most matter of fact one. <laughs> oh, that's great. That is so... I love... I like. We've talked about this so many times. I love the super... Straight to the point, but also vague IMDb plot synopsis. Yeah. <laughs> like, we... yeah, I mean, I guess that is a correct plot synopsis. <laughs> that, that is what the movie's about, but also there's a lot more to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, like, barely scratches the surface of what this is about. Uh, so, Mike, 8mm, you were kind of looking forward to it. What were your overall thoughts on this movie? I think my overall thoughts are not so great. Uh, didn't, didn't, <laughs> co- didn't, didn't live up to my expectations, I think. Um, yeah. No, I don't even know what they were. I guess that it would have been a fun time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this, movie, it, this movie decidedly is not a fun time. Uh, right. Yeah, I guess more, maybe not fun is not the right word. But it, I think coming right after a movie like Snake Eyes, which is sort of like it, it, they feel together. They feel like a pair of movies. Yeah, they're both about like kind of unraveling with this conspiracy and this uh, yeah. mystery kind of thing. Although Snake this, Eyes reveals who did it uh, very early on in the movie. Right. But I, I think it's it's you know Snake Eyes takes its I mean I guess you're you're right in that uh, eight millimeter is not is about a much more dark uh, <laughs> plot or uh, plot yeah I guess um, subject matter that it wouldn't be able to t- have as much you know be on eleven be kind of silly and aware of what it's doing like right. Snake Eyes was but it, it felt like you know Nicolas Cage is playing a kind of similar character in some weird way like a guy with questionable morals uh, he's willing to do some not so good things and in but in 8mm it it the, the the toll of what's going on is way more focused on and <laughs> right and with that said too um, I think 8mm and we also talked about with Snake Eyes how it's 90 whatever minutes 8mm is like 2 hours and 3 minutes or something like yeah, that yeah it's, it's longer and it also it feels like it ends and then there's 40 minutes left of the movie. Yeah, and that's yeah, that's my one of my notes was I'm pretty sure we've dragged on 40 minutes past the conclusion of this movie. Yeah. And I feel like that doesn't like it it, it goes to great lengths to tie up and and uh follow every loose thread, but like it could have been done in 10 or 15 minutes. Like it didn't need to be an yeah. extra 40 minutes of kind of nothing going on. Exactly. Yeah. I think uh this movie I thought it had a pretty solid mystery at its core and when it's just like yeah. focusing on the mystery and like you know, the kind of the gumshoe thing and, like, Cage yes. is going to Miami and then he's going to Hollywood and he's kind of gathering, like, these very incremental clues along the way. I think the mystery builds really well. Uh, and I think for about two-thirds of its running time, I was mostly on board with this movie. Yeah. Uh, there I, were... I was... Oh, no, go ahead. No, you, you, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, I was... I was really liking this movie, I think. Like, I would have had a much better opinion if it had ended with 40 minutes, like, when it... When the story ends. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think there, there, there were elements throughout the movie that I thought were pretty dumb. Um, you know, yeah. and, but like there was like he finds the girl's diary in the toilet. No, like yeah, nobody sure. ever thought to look there. Okay, um, but otherwise I was pretty engaged. But like the mystery is solved with about forty minutes left of the movie, uh, and it kind of has this big kind of climactic like battle scene where Cage is tied to the bed, and you know, yeah. Dino Velvet and uh, James Gandolfini are attacking him, and it's this whole thing. Uh, yeah, we and get we get no less than three slow motion deaths. Yeah, that's true. But we still got 40 minutes left. Yeah, but then a- after that, like, the mystery is solved, and you think, okay, the movie's going to, like, end soon. Uh, yeah. And then it becomes this, like, vigilante revenge thriller uh, yeah. that I was not nearly as on board with. I think it kind of loses uh, all... It-, it loses everything that the movie has to offer with Cage's character and uh, any kind yes. of morality this movie is trying to push. Uh, and, it, uh, you know, I enjoyed the kind of... Uh, 
underground porn world this movie was able to build. Um, I, I, I do think it should have been a little seedier. And <laughs> it's, I, I feel like uh, this material, this is stuff that Fincher would absolutely crush. Like I was watching oh, this and being yeah. like, David Fincher would like do something great with this. Uh, this just isn't Schumacher's thing. You know, I was, no. <laughs> there was, there was a point in time where I was watching it and it was Cage and Walking Phoenix kind of walking through the underground porn thing and you seeing these people in like S and get, S&M get ups and all that kind of stuff. And I was thinking to myself, yeah, this seems like the natural evolution of, uh, of bat nipples. <laughs> like <laughs> this it was just suits with nipples cut out of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was his it, reaction to the bat nipple. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, and I think when the uh, when the screenplay is allowed to breathe, I think it has some fun. There has like this pulpy quality to some of the dialogue uh, that I enjoyed. There's like this uh, a lot of dialogue exchanges that I think were like very dry and very funny. Uh, like there's the one bit where Cage and Phoenix talking. Anything with Cage and Phoenix, I thought the movie was probably at its best. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think Phoenix, um, his character is just on the verge of being really annoying. Uh, but but for the most part, he he works pretty well. Their relationship works. Um, so it's but like there's you know dialogue between the two of them where like Cage sends Walking Phoenix off back to Hollywood and he gives him like an envelope uh, and it's like what what is this? It's like it's money. You can use it to purchase goods and services. Like <laughs> you know, just like sarcastic kind of quips like here and there that like are fu- like they're funny and they're kind of like very downplayed. Kate, uh, let's get let's talk about Cage in this movie because I think sure. he's he's very much downplaying. Yeah. Uh, this rule, uh, especially compared to something like Snake Eyes, uh, where he's like, go, where he's at an eleven. Uh, you know, Cage is in you know serious mode for most of this movie until yeah. until he gets into yelling mode towards the end. <laughs> right, but even even then, that the yelling mode, which I did pick up on, uh, yeah, feels appropriate. Oh yeah, compared, it's, it's, it compared seems... to usual yelling mode Cage. Yeah, this this yelling mode Cage seems justified. It is yelling mode Cage only in that he is yelling. Uh, right. It's not it's not crazy like going go, going ballistic kind of yelling mode cage that we're used to in so many other movies. This is like serious yelling mode cage in, in a right. serious cage performance. It's uh, the Snyderverse yelling mode cage. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yelling mode cage is not the direction this movie should have gone in. You know, it's like uh, that last forty minutes is like just this revenge thriller, and you know you have Cage beating up James Gandolfini and then killing him, and then you have Cage. Uh, beating up machine and then killing him and it's like you're losing the thread of this character you're losing kind of like yeah. the morale and i guess maybe that's kind of the point but i feel like it's not played very well and it feels very sudden and it just feels like you know some of this could have been wrapped up in the climax that already existed in the movie <laughs> right you know yeah i definitely agree that the the last 40 the the revenge the thriller section of this movie um feels like it it, it comes out of nowhere it's it's almost it's almost earned. Like it's it's pretty close because kind of throughout the rest of the movie, he does kind of waffle back and forth between you know walking that line of morality. Right. Uh, he's very willing to lie to people to get the information he needs, but he also is a family man. Like he you know he has all those gumshoe qualities, like yeah. you know, pulp pulp fiction qualities. Uh, but then at the end, I guess he ex- he experiences the climax and this trauma, but like we don't get any progression into the the. the the third act, it just kind of like we just slam into it and yeah. like now we're murderer. Like what? <laughs> like <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it, it it feels like the movie dials it up to eleven. Uh, yeah. To use a phrase that you keep using, uh, <laughs> it's appropriate when talking to Cage. <laughs> yeah, it's true. The the movie dials it up to eleven, but like Cage doesn't. Like I feel like it doesn't quite earn dialing it up to eleven. You know. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's it. I did, I, like, I did like Nicolas Cage and Walking Phoenix together a lot. They had a very good, I think, like veteran cop slash rookie cop dynamic right. going on. I feel like that was kind of what they were drawing from. Uh, now, how do you think this role fits into the roles that we've seen Cage play so far? Does this remind you of anything uh, of other Cage movies? Uh, I guess Snake Eyes is the one that I – probably just because we just watched another crime thriller <laughs> with Cage in it. But, um, it, it feels sort of like – I mean, I guess I don't know. With with Joel Schumacher, I can't really say that this is one of those, uh, you know, like a smaller drama that Cage, like, you know, Cage advocated uh, <laughs> in leaving Las Vegas. Right. But it, it feels like an attempt at that, maybe? Like, Maybe. It seems like a very, it's a serious-minded studio picture that the studio kind of mangled yeah. um, by yeah. trying to force it to be a little, like, less downbeat. <laughs> right, which is pretty. I mean, like, I guess I didn't notice where it becomes upbeat. Oh, not that it is upbeat, <laughs> but um, right. But the tone, the tone, I guess, is lighter, lighter than what Andrew Kevin Walker originally had in had mind. Written. 
Uh, and I think part of that, I think part of the climax is that like kind of it, like, I think, I think part of the reason why it goes into that revenge thriller mode. And I, I I don't know what was in Andrew Kevin Walker's script, so I can't say for sure. Um, but I feel like part of the reason it goes into that revenge thriller thing at during the last 40 minutes is because it kind of gives the audience, you know, satisfaction of seeing these guys die. Right. Uh, And then, and then the movie wraps up with like that letter from the, uh, the girl's (laughs) mother. (laughs) I forgot about that letter. (laughs) It's like, Oh, it's it's going to be okay. You guys. (laughs) Yeah, fade to credits. It's like gonna, that's <laughs> it's going to be fine. Uh, Cage smiles, fade to black. Cut the credits, and it's it's yep. fine. Uh, I will say we have seen Nicolas Cage play a private investigator once before, Mike, and that was in a little movie called Honeymoon in Vegas. Oh my god! <laughs> so I like to imagine that this is the sequel to that movie. <laughs> yeah, you know, Cage and Sarah Jessica Parker's marriage didn't work. No, nope. <laughs> they, they it, tried. It dissolved, but you can't build a marriage on flying Elvises and. <laughs> Uh, instead, we get it one built on underground porn rings. Yep. <laughs> Which I do agree with you, though. You said earlier that that's kind of your favorite part of it, or you know, it's one of the better parts of the film, like that world building of that world that Max California is. Oh yeah. Kind of taking us into, and I do, I agree with you. That was really interesting. It was dark. It was weird. But then we we get like silly action movie climax and then just a weird revenge thriller part after it yeah it was it was odd but i liked the action movie climax it was just the it was just the revenge thriller part that i took issue with uh i did also think this movie is kind of similar to red rock west in tone uh yeah and also uh with the climax happening and then there's still 40 minutes left to go remind me a lot of, remind me a lot of deadfall uh, yeah <laughs> deadfall was when you first asked me i like i thought of that but i didn't want to bring it up because it's nowhere near the same performance <laughs> Um, no, it's a very different performance, but just the way that the movie is structured, I feel like it's, uh, yeah. it reminds me of Deadpool, Deadfall in that way. Uh, also, there is a driving through Hollywood montage, much like in Valley Girl, although this, this one is a lot seedier, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a little grimier, a little darker than the one in Valley Girl. Uh, yeah. Although I, I guess that's really a matter of perspective. But <laughs> Right. Yeah. Maybe that's just your life. I did really like that, how, how often we are uh, following – cage through some kind of like falling apart warehouse past like a seamstress shop into a porn producer's office like it's just so weird and yeah. gross and seedy but like at the same time it, fe- it feels very appropriate for everything else that's going on yeah uh also fun fact nicholas cage's oscar makes a cameo in this movie uh what? <laughs> yeah there's an oscar on uh, james gandolfini's desk uh <laughs> and it's actually nicholas cage it's actually oscar. nicholas cage's real leaving las vegas oscar <laughs> That's amazing. So that's neat. Um, yeah. But were, were there any uh, moments or scenes in this movie that stood out to you? I feel like I got to talk about Peter Stormare, who is playing the Nicolas Cage role in this movie. <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, you're not wrong. <laughs> he is playing the role that Cage should be playing in this movie. He's totally off kilter. Uh, Fe- uh, Joaquin Phoenix calls him at one point the Jim Jarmusch of S&M. <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was a great reference, also a reference that 90% of the audience won't get. Uh, yeah, it, it even whooshed me. Please explain, Mike. <laughs> Jim Jarmusch is a, uh, is a director, a film director. Got it. Uh, <laughs> I, su- I assume. <laughs> yeah, he's a guy who did, uh, at, at that time, he was probably most, most known for Dead Man with Johnny Depp. Mm, okay. Um, but recently, like, he did Only Love is Left Alive. Um, yeah. Uh, he, he most recently just came out with Patterson, with, with uh, Adam Driver. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I thought, that, I thought that was a pretty funny line. And, like, when, when he's... When he shows up, when Peter Stormare shows up, like, I can see it. Like, he's, yeah. he's very eccentric and very weird, uh, and he just has, like, these really strange line readings, and there's very, very weird stuff going on. I think my favorite scene in the movie uh, is when Stormare has Cage, like, tied down, and he says, we're going to go after your family! And then he eats a photo of Cage's family. Yeah. <laughs> That was great. That was so. I was. I had to like double check and make sure I was watching the same movie that I was watching an hour ago. Because no, this isn't right. <laughs> I was like, I didn't even like. I, like, where did he get that photo of Cage's family? I, <laughs> it was just such a such a weird moment uh, to yeah. throw in there. Uh, so that was weird. And also, he has a uh, a great line reading. Stormare has um, when he says uh, when Longdale uh, screws them over. Uh, Cage, mm-hmm. like Cage mentions that, like, uh, well, first of all, I, I enjoy, like I said, I enjoyed the way the mystery unfolded. I, I thought the stuff with Longdale showing up, and it turns out Longdale's actually like 
uh, perpetuating the case. Uh, right. I thought that was a pretty good reveal. Uh, you know, Cage is tied to the bed and Max California dies and that was upsetting. Uh, and that's, yeah. that's kind of when I thought, oh, this is the end of the movie because like, oh, right. Max California dies. Like, yeah. Um, and then Stor- uh, but then Cage like starts shouting out that Longdale fucked them. Right. right. Longdale fucked us. Longdale fucked you. Uh, and then Gandalfini and Peter Stormare kind of look at each other like, wait, what is he saying? Like, what? And yeah. St- and Stormare goes, I think he's saying that Longdale fucked us, which is just like totally, completely bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it, it, it turns into a def- very, very different movie once <laughs> once his character shows up <laughs> and after that climax, like. Yeah. It's- it's so weird. It's it's very it's it, it is very much like a movie that did not decide what movie it wanted to be. Yeah, uh, which is uh, which is a shame. But are there any other scenes in this movie that stood out to you? Uh, um, in this movie? I think kind of most of any time uh, Max California, Joaquin Phoenix is on screen involved when they're doing their buddy cop thing. Yes, uh, I think he he was a really interesting character that you know uh, he's just like the guy with the blue spiky hair and the belly shirt that works at the porn shop. Right, uh, and Cage immediately. It's like, what are you like? You know, he picks out that he's hiding whatever he's reading, and he flips it over, and it's "In Cold Blood" by Truman Capote. Yes. And we find out he's actually really smart. And <laughs> I thought that line when he says, when he uses the word "patina," he's like, "You show up asking questions. It just has a certain patina, you know." And Cage <laughs> makes was like, "What?" And he's like, "It's a Capote word." Like, <laughs> I thought that was really funny, yes. uh, and I thought it was it, it goes a long way to show that he is. Despite, you know, whatever preconceived notions you may have about the guy that looks weird that works at the porn shop, he deftly navigates that CD underbelly, excuse me, that CD underbelly. And I think that was, the, I don't know, I thought that was really cool. Like you said, it's the kind of rookie cop, veteran cop dynamic they have going on. Yeah, like he's just excited to be there, like a lot of the time. Right. He's excited to be helping Nicholas Cage with this case. I think his intro is actually uh, one of my favorite scenes in the movie. The uh, Like his his first line where he's just like, hey, sir, can I, can I interest you in a battery-powered vagina today? Yeah, yeah. And Cage's like, oh, no, thanks. And he keeps going. And it's like, well, I wouldn't want you to be in a situation where, where you need a battery-powered vagina and you don't have one. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> uh, so that was good. I, I really enjoy Joaquin Phoenix in this movie. I, I really enjoy Joaquin Phoenix in general. I think he's one of the best actors working today. Um, yeah. as, but he uh, has a really good uh, performance in this movie. One of his earlier – I think it's one of his earlier performances too. He was, this is like pretty early on in Joaquin Phoenix's career, I would say. Um, so that's neat. That's cool. That's a cool yeah. thing this movie has to offer. Uh, I also wanted to say that uh, Cage's daughter's name in this movie is Cinderella, which seems conceited. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't tell if that's just what they called her because I mean they called her Cindy a lot. I thought it was a nickname at first too, but it, they kept calling her Cinderella a couple times. And I feel like it was her actual yeah. name. Uh, it might just, be. I don't know. That just seems conceited to me. <laughs> yeah, no one would really do that. I met somebody. Well, they I met somebody today whose daughter was named Ripley, uh, named after the uh, the character Alien? from Alien. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, and and I wouldn't mind that so much, but every time, like she was kind of, kind of touring my office, and yes. every time she met somebody and they asked her about her daughter, she would say, "Oh, her name is Ripley, named after the character from Alien." Wow, <laughs> like she would add that to the end of every set, every set, every time she brought it up, and I was like, "Like I get it, like, like yeah." <laughs> Like, That's I, pretty funny. I know who Ripley is. <laughs> <laughs> I feel kind of bad. That kid's got a lot to live up to. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they got to take down at least one alien in their lifetime. Yeah. Or like, Maybe uh, even a queen. We uh, don't know. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but that's completely irrelevant to what we're talking about. <laughs> uh, I also wanted to say that uh, Mrs. Christian and Longdale, when they first arrived, reminded me of uh, the Elder Lebowski and Brant from The Big Lebowski. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> you're not wrong and there's even like the scene where like they're 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 in like the big room and i feel like i, I feel like i could have seen like philip seymour hoffman like dramatically opening the doors and yeah <laughs> this is christian being like what makes a man nicholas cage <laughs> <laughs> on a weekday <laughs> is it <laughs> uh also cage uses computer enhancement to clear up a photo because that is how computers work uh, yeah i i do love how uh man like how dated, but yet it's one of those things whenever you watch a movie from the late 90s, early 2000s, where oh, it's yeah. like the highest tech, but now it's like, well, come on, bro. Like, <laughs> like, we're doing this thing. He's using the camera to take a blow up picture of a frame from an eight millimeter film, and like, it's crystal clear. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, and then he's printing out Polaroids at his computer, and it's like, whoa, crazy shit, man. Uh, and then also, we get a scene where he calls an operator. Yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, so outdated. Yeah, very much. Uh, also, so in the final act of this movie, Cage kidnaps James Gandolfini, uh, and ties him up and beats him up. And I think Gandolfini is great in this scene. Like he's really, really yeah. good. Uh, he's doing like this very like taunting Cage kind of intense performance uh, when Cage uh, can't bring himself to kill him. And then Cage goes outside and asks permission to kill him, and then he kills him. <laughs> Like, he doesn't just kill him. He lights him on fire. Yeah. He, <laughs> I think he might be dead by then. But. He super kills him. Uh, yeah. And this, this is where the movie, like, loses any sense of morality and any sense of Cage's character, I think, during this last half hour. Uh, and yeah. he, the, he calls, the person he calls is the girl's mom. And he calls her and he's like, oh, I know everything that happened to your daughter. And he just, like, tearfully tells her about how her daughter's dead. And it just seemed like the wrong move. <laughs> like, it just seemed like the wrong way to break that news, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I get the because you know earlier in the film he does he does ask, would you rather hope she's alive for the rest of your life or would you want to know the truth if like whatever happened, and she says I would rather know. Yeah. Um, so like it happened like I get like where that that payoff it like or what they're trying to pay off, uh, but it just feels really weird. Yeah, um, but yeah, that was it's just a very like, oddly done scene. And then Cage goes to track down Machine. Uh, and they fight. Machine has him pinned down at one point, but then has to monologue because he's the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, we have to have a stab party in the cemetery. <laughs> yes, but uh, I mean, Alex specifically, like, there's like he has Cage pinned down, like he's knife a, at his throat, knife at his throat, and then he just starts talking, and he just <laughs> keeps talking, and yeah. it's like, dude, like, I, I I realize this came out a couple of years before The Incredibles, but like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's like you know, in the Incredibles. It's like, hey, what does he do? He starts monologuing, <laughs> uh, yeah. and then it's played as a big reveal that Machine is just a regular guy when he takes off his mask, and it's like, so, like, <laughs> like yeah, like, yeah, it, it, who it, else it would felt, he be? <laughs> right. It felt a lot like um, they were trying to say something. Like I felt like they were trying to make some point, and like I don't know what it was. Yeah, <laughs> like, like I, mean, I, I mean, he kind of he kind of looks like I think it was John Wayne Gacy. Is what he, like when he puts his glasses on, like he like he's just like this weird, you know. Yeah, he I just looks that. like a nerdy old guy. Yeah, I think the point is that like evil lurk can lurk in anybody. Like he can just look right. be a normal person, but you could also be evil. Uh, but like it's. It just it comes off as so flat because like we've never seen this guy before, you yeah. know we've never seen him without the mask on. So when he takes off the mask off and it's like this big reveal, he's just a normal guy. It's like, all right, <laughs> okay, cool, <laughs> whatever. Uh, can we're, we're now thirty five minutes past the climax of this movie? Can we please right. wrap this up? <laughs> Uh, and then the movie ends with Cage uh, returning back to his uh, wife and kid, crying in her arms, says, like, save me. Uh, and and then he gets a letter from the girl's mom. Everything's going to be OK. Roll credits. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I can't say for sure whether Andrew Kevin Walker's script was better because uh, I've not seen it. Uh, but I can almost guarantee it would have taken the subject matter a lot further uh, and it wouldn't have had such a pat ending uh, to the movie. It feels, yes. it feels like it kind of just like wraps everything up in a little bow. Uh, and this doesn't. This story doesn't seem like it lends itself well to that uh, right. kind of ending. Yeah, no, I think you're definitely right in that. Um, like, think thinking about what the, the the David Fincher version might have been, like that that climax that happens in the warehouse, like and you know, the the actual climax of the movie. Yeah. Um, like, we probably would have left maybe people alive. Like, well, it's, it's, you know, loose ends would have been allowed to exist yeah. instead of we just go track them down for 40 minutes. Yeah, remember, like, Seven is one of the, like, has such a bleak ending. <laughs> yes, exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> like, thinking about this with Seven, uh, like, how it treats its subject matter, what it says about humanity, like, what this, like, what 8 millimeters reveal of what Who Machine is, is almost trying to say, I think Seven does. <laughs> and says it. And, like, is good. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, in conclusion, eight millimeter is not as good as seven. <laughs> right. That's what we're trying to say. <laughs> but it does continue the theme of Andrew Kevin Walker scripts that are in sequential order. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> seven, it. eight millimeter, and I, I would love for him to make a movie with the number nine in there somewhere. It's Maybe. gonna turn out he wrote the nine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That animated stop motion movie from <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> several years ago that nobody remembers. That one. <laughs> that one. <laughs> That's the one. That is the one. All right. So, Mike, is there anything else you want to say about Eight Millimeter before we move on to Netflix reviews? Um, no, I think I think we've said it all. The first uh, ninety minutes or so were actually a pretty interesting, engaging thriller mystery 
dark seedy underbelly of the world kind of thing and then yeah. it just kind of falls apart <laughs> yeah i would agree with that like there's it's a very solid mystery up to a certain point and then once the mystery is solved and there's 40 minutes left in the movie the movie just completely falls apart yes uh, yeah and that's a bummer but you know cage is solid in it like he's doing yeah gumshoe mystery work and uh that's that's fun it's a, ser- a more serious performance than we're used to seeing from him uh you know even like a lot of time even like his serious work is at least a little funny you know, and yeah. and in this movie, it's really not. Uh, but he has like yeah. some got solid like one liners and like stuff like that. There's good stuff in this movie, so I, you know, it's not a great movie, but there is qualities to recommend about it. That uh, yeah, I would I would suggest. But anyway, let's move on to Netflix reviews, Mike. And uh, these Netflix reviews are interesting because a lot of them are very upset that this movie even exists. <laughs> oh my god! I, yes, <laughs> I have I have a feeling our friend our old friend will be here. I think. Uh, well, not quite, but there are. Oh. Uh, pe- people that are just like shocked at the content that this movie has to offer. Um, yeah, there is definitely stuff that if like it's here, I was a little surprised that they were able to show these things, but I just could imagine like the David Fincher version of what those are. And it would have been yeah. so much better. Would have been crazier. Uh, anyway, so yeah, here is a two star review of eight millimeter. A man watches a film that leaves him feeling bitter and angry. That's the story of my night watching eight millimeter. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I love the zinger reviews. That's <laughs> that, was, that was the best one. It starts off looking promisingly like a gritty thriller, but then changes its mind half a dozen times about what sort of film it is, finally settling on just being a mess. Uh, so that is a two-star review. Here's a three-star review of 8mm. Using an 8mm film should have been a tip-off, because who uses them anymore? <laughs> what? <laughs> Kidding aside, while this film is nowhere near Seven or Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but it was a legit thriller that had its share of WTF moments. Watch Eight Millimeter and Who Took the Last Reel? Bunch of question marks. <laughs> sure. That, that is completely nonsensical. I have no idea what any of that meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I did think of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo while watching this. Yeah, I can see that because the, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo has a lot to do with uh, sex crimes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, and and it's a similar kind of story. Uh, right. Both of them are Fincher adjacent. In that case, it was actually directed by David Fincher, and in this one, it was not. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and here's a four star review of Eight Millimeter. This movie just came came out just as the dot com and online porn thing blew up. <laughs> Uh, I can see how in 1999 this would be a shocking film. However, with a click of the mouse, you know the rest. <laughs> so sure. I, think, I think he's like really advocating for porn after watching 8mm, which is not the the response you want <laughs> Right after watching 8mm. Yeah, that is actually a kind of an interesting point. They, they bring it up in the film at one point when they're in the one of the underground warehouse illegal porn things or whatever. Yeah. And they're talking about now that you can go online and get, you know, find all these things that the, the, the meetups are going away and stuff. And it was, yeah. I thought that was an interesting, like, you know, the, sad, like, the sad demise of the underground porn industry is, yeah, <laughs> is really exactly. what this movie's about. But it's the, it's the, what was the best parts of the film was that like weird world building of gross stuff. Yes. <laughs> uh, they talk about that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, here's, here's a two star review of eight millimeter. <laughs> The first snuff film my wife and I went to, we walked out of. <laughs> we, we also got our money back. The only things like this that should be made are documentaries. There is so much of this in real life. Why would anyone want to put it in their head at all, let alone pay to see it? A very sad statement to filmmakers' idea of making money and people buy it up. What a world we live in. Junk food makes junkier minds. Wow. Uh, so I, I'm not sure if the guy realized that he said that he went to a snuff film with his wife. <laughs> I don't know where that would have been broadcasting. <laughs> I'm not sure. But I'd like to imagine that's a thing that happened. <laughs> uh, here's a four-star review of 8mm. And you got uh, you got to read this as if it's like the existential narration in an old film noir. So okay. here we go. I have come to realize the corruption that exists in our society, the perversions of man's sick desires for the sake of erotica. <laughs> oh, awareness of this sadistic and demonic compulsion of fellow humankind sickens me and angers me immensely. This film should provoke an uprise in our society to eliminate the thriving business that takes young people in pain, hopeless and disillusioned by the lack of morality or values to end pornography, the trafficking of children into sexual bondage, which births despair, formulating a plague of predators relentless in their selfish pleasures of depravity, and results separation from God and all that is true. Wow. 
<laughs> the light, the lights come back up and you turn back into the scene. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, and finally, here's a five star review. <laughs> Wait, was that a four star review? That was a four star review. It <laughs> okay. was a four star review, eight millimeter. Here's a five star review. This is the last one. I really love Nicolas Cage as an actor. I enjoyed watching this movie because of his acting, but however, beware. The evil is upon us. This is more real than we care to admit. So sit back and relax and watch the fake because real in your eyes. And now it starts, now the rest of it's in all caps. Great movie, better reality, makes you question, do you really know who your neighbors are? Do you really know who your friend and family are? Do you really want to let people know who you really are? <laughs> In the movie, you will have to choice if you really want to know the answer. Enjoy. Great crime thriller. Wow. I was really hoping it was going to drop into some Boy George at the end there. <laughs> do you really want to hurt me? <laughs> do you really want to make me cry? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So yeah, those that's, are the yeah. What were that's you? a bold. That's a bold review. That's a bold <laughs> review. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'll scared lie. that it that it says good movie, better reality. Like that's <laughs> not so sure. Yeah, that is a a little off putting. Uh, anyway, those are the Netflix reviews of Eight Millimeter. A pretty wide mix of people. There were a lot of positive reviews actually of Eight Millimeter on Netflix. Um, I'm surprised. So there's that as well. But uh, anyway, Mike. So Eight Millimeter, not great. Yeah. Like, okay, sure, I watched it. Yeah, it was fine. There was a lot of stuff that uh, was enjoyable, like some solid mystery stuff in there. But for yeah. the most part, it's a pretty underwhelming movie, which is uh, yeah. disappointing. But there you have it. Uh, so, Mike, where can we find you online this week? You can find me at twitter.com slash mdfilmblog. And if you like Dungeons & Dragons, my friends and I post our games at youtube.com slash geonerd79. And you can find me online at twitter.com slash msmithfilmblog and all of our podcasts and stuff at filmbook.com. Thank you so much for listening to The Complete Works. I'm Mike Smith. That is Mike's pre show. If you are listening to this review via our podcast on iTunes, please subscribe to the podcast, rate it, and take a moment to give us a review. Uh, help support this podcast and Filmbook by taking part in our Patreon campaign. You can find our Patreon campaign page at patreon.com slash filmbook. Any and all feedback, compliments, topic discussions, and even hate mail can be sent directly to podcast at filmbook.com. Dot com. Please list the podcast you were emailing about in the title of your email because we appreciate just so many different ones hard to keep track. We would love to hear from you. Join us in two weeks for another episode of The Complete Works in which we will be talking about Nicolas Cage's role in Martin Scorsese's Bringing Out the Dead. That is a very exciting one, Mike. I'm pretty stoked to uh, talk about that one. Yeah, that's another one I've never seen before, but I've heard a lot about, so yes. I'm, I'm pretty pumped. Yes, so that's uh, pretty exciting. And plus, you can keep an eye out for Film Bookcast next week, where we'll either be talking about Split or Triple X The Returns of Andrew Cage, or both, if we can see both. Uh, I have seen Split. It was pretty good. Uh, Mike, I, you haven't seen either of these yet? No, I haven't gotten oh, any reviews yet. No, no, I have not. Well, I mean, you haven't seen either of the movies yet either. Oh, either of those. That makes way more sense. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> I thought you said, have you seen any reviews yet? Well, you, you, uh, haven't, you haven't been spoiled on Split yet? No, that's one that I've heard uh, not like to make your best effort to not be spoiled on. So I'm pulling out all my unsullied stops, and I'm not not gonna get spoiled on. Yeah, I hope hopefully. I hope you can make it because it is a uh, it is very interesting to say the least. Um, but that is that is split triple X. Uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be reviewing one of those two uh, next week. I think probably split uh, if we end up having to do. I mean, I haven't seen triple X yet, so. Uh, but you, you're you going to see one of them, right? Like, you haven't decided yet? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm going to, with all the hype I've heard about Split now, uh, I'm going to try to see that instead of Triple X. Okay, yeah, I'll probably uh, see I'll probably see Triple X this weekend anyway, so I'll be able to talk about that in the discussions or whatever if we yeah. need to. But uh, anyway, so pretty excited to talk about Split, though. I feel like i got to get this out about certain things that happen in Split. Oh, uh, man. So all right. look out for that next week. Thank you so much for listening, guys, and thanks for getting in the cage. <laughs>